book of Matthew 26, chapter number 26, and verse number 36. Please pray for Nancy Owsley. She fell and hurt herself, and she needs your prayers, folks. She's 96 or 7 years old. Please pray for Nancy Owsley. And pray for Daniel Keith. He has an infection around his heart. That's not a good thing at all. So please pray for Daniel. Matthew chapter number 26 and verse number 36. Then cometh Jesus with them to a place called Gethsemane, and saith to the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith to Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Father, bless this holy book. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. I want to preach to you this morning about Gethsemane, Gabbatha, and Golgotha. These are three distinct locations that bear directly on the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. Words fail and are very inadequate to convey to us this morning the full message of the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. But He did suffer. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this world and the Bible said He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He came to suffer. He came to lay His life down on a cross and there give Himself so that we could be saved. If you'll notice you've read in Matthew chapter number 26 of a place called Gethsemane. Then cometh he to a place called Gethsemane. We know that Peter, uh, that, uh, that Judas Iscariot, rather, when he brought the, uh, when he brought the uh, guards with him to take Christ by force and take him into captivity, the Scripture says that he knew where he would be because he was wont to go to this place. So here at Gethsemane was not the first time beneath the old olive trees that our Lord Jesus Christ had prayed. He was a man of prayer. He prayed constantly. And he prayed there at Gethsemane time and time and time again. Born a babe in a manger. Like all the rest of us, he learned. And the Bible said the grace of God was upon him. And he grew in stature. And he grew in grace. He grew in understanding. And he grew in knowledge of the Word of God and of God himself. Our Lord Jesus Christ had one distinct difference between him and me. And that is that he was not born with original sin. He did not have the curse of Adam in his bones like I had when I came into this world. But learn he did. And my friend, it didn't take him long to understand that while he came into this world, there was a cross before him. There was a place for him to die and suffer and give himself as a ransom for our sins. That day approached every day of his life. He lived with the cross ever before him, understanding that the time would come when he would come to the tree, and there he would be crucified so that I could be born again and that you could be born again. But my friend, as the hour approached, it got darker. As the hour got, uh, as came, came closer to him, he began to realize that there was something lying before him that human mind could never conceive. 
There was a darkness and a depth and an evil that awaited him. For the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world was about to descend into a hell that no one could ever understand but he himself. And my friend, he did in three separate places. He did at Gethsemane, he did at Gabbatha, and he did at Golgotha. And so I want you to look at Gethsemane with me this morning for just a few minutes, and then we'll move from there to Gabbatha, and then we'll go to Golgotha. The Lord Jesus Christ prayed as it were great drops of blood, and there he poured his soul out before God. The Bible said that he was sore amazed at what came before him while his soul was poured out to Almighty God. What happened was the billows of God's wrath began to roll upon his soul. He began to feel the wrath of Almighty God because he as the Lamb of God was about to bear the sin of every human being that had ever lived upon the face of the earth. He was going to take it into himself on that cross the next day when they would nail him to the tree. There the Lord Jesus Christ said became very heavy. And my friend, he said, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. The cup that he was praying about was not the death at the cross. That had nothing to do with it. The cross, the cup that he was talking about was not being, was not being whipped at Pilate's court. When he was scourged and his back was laid open and they could see the sinew and the bone and the muscle and the blood running all over him, that was horrible indeed. But the cup that he was talking about was the wrath of God poured out against sin because he himself would become sin for us who knew no sin. And it was that cup the Lord Jesus Christ knew that he would have to drink to its dregs. He would have to drink all of it. Everything God could possibly pour out against sin would be poured out against him that day. And he must take it within himself. Not coming from a man. Not coming from you. Not coming from me. Or not even coming from sin or Satan. This wrath was coming from God Almighty. It was a pure, holy, righteous God that dwells between the cherubim that was about to pour down upon His own Son the wrath of Almighty God to taste the sinner's death to taste the sinner's condemnation and to take within himself what you and I fully deserve to receive. He took it all in his body and in his soul on the cross that day. So there at Gethsemane, my friend, he descended deeper. And the deeper he descended, the, the, the more horror he experienced. And this is what Hebrews 5 is talking about. When it says he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied with fear, he cried out to God. With fear, he sought the face of the Lord. With fear, he became completely dependent upon the Holy One. And the Bible says there he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. It was at Gethsemane that our great high priest was being fashioned. Our salvation was being put together. It was there that the nuts and the bolts and everything that made us what we are was coming together at Gethsemane. It was there that our great high priest was being formed for who he is today at Gethsemane, friend. You can't remove Gethsemane. You can't belittle it. You can't push it out of the way for it was absolutely and completely necessary for him to go first to Gethsemane before he ever went to the cross. And the next place that he went to, according to the Scripture, is Gabbatha. John chapter number 19, verses 1 through 13 talks about Gabbatha. It was there at Gabbatha. Say, so what is that, preacher? Gabbatha is the place of the stone. The Greek word for it is lithostratus. Lethos and stratus, in plainer words, the level of the stone. The Romans were very fond of paving their areas in stone. They would use multicolored stones and put them together to form a floor. And they loved to do this. The, the Romans were great builders. Our Lord Jesus Christ was brought in on the stone. He stood on the most beautiful thing around that area, something man had built and put together with his own hands. And there he stood before Pontius Pilate. Our Lord Jesus Christ was brought, my friend, as a common criminal, condemned to die before a prelate of the earth, before a judge of man, to judge him, to determine whether he lived or whether he died. He fell into the hands of sinners. It was there at uh, Gabbatha, Lethostratus, that our Lord Jesus Christ stood as the Lamb of God, meek, 
before his shearer. He was dumb that day, did not try to defend himself. And it was there at Gabbatha that they mocked him and made fun of him. It was there, my friend, they played games. It was in the fortress of Antonio, right next to the Temple Mount. If you ever go there, you can look into the floor, the stone, and the guide will show you a place that is carved into stone that's at least 2,000 years old. It's a game that the Romans played. And when they played this game, they would determine what they, whoever won the game could have whatever he wanted, what they were playing for. It's like playing cards or it's like throwing dice. And so they played the game on the lithostratus for the robe of our Lord Jesus Christ or for whatever else that they wanted from him. It was there that the Son of Man stood before Pontius Pilate to be judged of men, the judge of all mankind. What an irony is to be judged by a common man, by a man who's going to live and die like all the rest of us. And here's the Son of Man to be judged by him. Oh, my friend, I don't think you can see what's going on here at the Lithostratus. You see, my friend, the Roman has his stone. He laid his, gra he laid his floor down with his beautiful stone. But their stone is not my stone. I have a stone that's not their stone. I have a rock of the rock of ages. I have a rock that the builders rejected. I've got a rock that I stand on. I stand on a solid rock, my my friend, and it was not made with the hands of men. The rock that I stand on is a sure, sure foundation, a sure foundation, and cannot be moved. So you have your stone, I've got mine. You've got your religion, I have my Savior. You've got your judgment seat, I've got the great white throne judgment. You've got your world, and your judgment, and your culture, and your courts, but I've got the great court of heaven that one day will try all of us who have drawn the breath of life. And so the Lord Jesus Christ there at Gethsemane cried as it were great drops of blood. And at Gabbatha they mocked him and made fun of him. And my friend, he stood before the judge. It was there that he had been betrayed by Judas Iscariot. He'd been beaten by the temple guards. He'd been rejected by the people that he came to die for and he was scourged. Psalm chapter number 129 and verse 3 says this. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. Cut him. Cut him deeply. Plucked his beard out. Jerked it from his face. And the Bible said his visage was marred more than any man. I don't suppose that Mary knew him when she looked up into his face at Calvary. Her own son that she'd brought into the world bore no resemblance to the Lord Jesus Christ. His face had been turned into a piece of sausage, laid open his back. The blood was running all over him and the crown of thorns shoved down upon his head. And they mocked him and put a robe upon him and bowed the knee to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. What more indignity could they have done to him? It was at Gethsemane that our priest was formed and began to take shape. It was at Gabbatha that he was sealed. And then there at, Geth at Golgotha he was taken to be nailed to a cross. In the book of John, chapter number 19 and verse number 16, it tells us that he was there at Golgotha, which is also in Latin called Calvary. It means the skull. The rabbis teach that it was here that God formed Adam at Golgotha, at, at, uh, at Calvary. Here the Lord Jesus Christ came to the final place in his steps toward God in giving himself for us. For, for us to be saved. It was at Golgotha that the Lord Jesus Christ was nailed on a tree and there gave himself so that we could be saved. But it was at Golgotha that he fell into the hands of God. At Gethsemane, Satan no doubt came upon him. At Gethsemane, Satan no doubt tried to sift him. At, at, Gal, at Gethsemane, Satan no doubt tried to kill him. At Gethsemane, Satan is the one with all the demons of hell that brought down upon the head of the Son of God every evil thing possible. And at Gabbatha, the people made fun of him. The, the soldiers mocked him. But at Calvary, it's no longer the people that matter. The people can scream and yell all they want to. And Satan can do as he pleases. But on the cross at Calvary, 
It is in the hands of God that our Lord Jesus Christ had come. Notice the progression from Satan to man and now to God. There at the cross at Calvary, he was in the will of God. He was in the will of God the Father to die on the tree. And that's what a remarkable thing. There is no love that you could ever understand except the love of God in Christ Jesus. If you say there's nobody that loves you, you don't understand the Bible. You don't understand the gospel of the grace of God. I got a message from through the line of Judah just a couple of days ago. And the man said, Preacher, God loves you, but he doesn't love me. God saved you, but he's condemned me for an eternity in hell. He said, Preacher, I'm not one of the elect. I simply have no hope that I'll ever be saved. I got a letter from a girl in Taiwan. I've gotten about 10 or 12 in the last few days from this girl. She's very upset and very distraught. And she says to me, Preacher, she says, I'm in Taiwan. She says, I was born with birth defects. I have no education. I have no income. Nobody cares for me. Here I am with this land. She say, I'd just as well be dead. And what do you say back to somebody like that? You say this to them, that by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. By the grace of God, he tasted your death, and he tasted my death. He tasted the death of the murderer. He tasted the death of the rapist. He tasted the death of the thief. He tasted the death of every sinner that ever lived on the face of the earth. Another woman writes to me and she said, Preacher, and it was a two-page letter, and I've been praying for her. As soon as I got that letter, I took it upstairs. I went into my closet and I laid it down on the floor, and I put my hand upon that letter. And I said, Lord Jesus, help this family. Here's what she said, and maybe she's listening to this message this morning. I said, Lord God, by the grace of God, come down upon this family. These people need your help. They need your presence. They need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They need doors to be opened. She needs you to put your arms around her. She said, Preacher, she says, I don't know why I'm alive. She said, I'd just as soon be dead. i just as well commit suicide. For a long time, she said, we've held out. Everything's gone wrong against our family and against us, and we can't change it. And we've held out. We've prayed. We've tried. But it continues to get worse. And she said, now I see it affecting my husband. She said, pray for us, preacher. She says, this is long overdue. She said, I should have written you a long time ago. She said, we are about to give up hope. We can't see any light. We can't see any help. And we think God has abandoned us. Would you pray for us, preacher? There is no God in our life anymore. There's no power in our soul. There's no blood covering us. There's no presence of the Lord in our family. Pray for me, preacher. And you get a, you get a letter like that from somebody, you better do some praying. Amen. And that's exactly what I did. But I'm going to tell you something this morning and hear me well. I expect God to do something in that family. I expect the Holy Ghost to begin to move in that family. I expect God to begin to lift some burdens, open some doors, and for some light to come shining through. When you think you're broken, you're not. When you think you're at the end of your road, you're not. When you think there is no hope, there is hope. Amen. When you think that there's nothing that can be done to change your situation, yes, there is. As long as God the Almighty lives, there is hope as long as the Holy Ghost is in this world there is hope as long as the blood of Christ covers sin there is hope he tasted death for every man and I want you to know right now my friend there's victory there's victory for God Almighty loves us the Bible said neither life nor death the principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus he loves us he will answer our prayer he will come to us. Sometimes it's not when we expect it. Sometimes it's not the way we expect it. But you can be sure he will never leave you nor forsake you. So I say to her, bless her heart, I got your letter. I got on my face and I cried out to God over it. It's something, my friend, when you start getting letters from all over the world and you realize the predicament that people are in. Oh, by the way, 
We've had three more people saved just in the last three days off of the Lion of Judah and that Jack Chick track. That brings a total of seven people that have been born again in the last two weeks since I posted that on the Internet. I don't know why I waited so long. Dumb, I reckon. For some reason, God had to kick this mule and say, put something on there and show people how to get saved. And when I did, he started saving people. Hallelujah to God. Amen. So I take no credit for anything. I'm belated by doing it, but thank God he's doing it. Seven souls, folks. Seven people had one woman saved in Russia, had them saved in England, had them saved in America. They're being saved all over the earth. And that's the good thing about the Internet, folks. It reaches everywhere. Hallelujah to God. So there's hope. There's hope. Satan's work is the area of unbelief, despair, damnation, condemnation. Satan's greatest work is done when he can cast a shadow between you and God. If he can put a wall up between you and the Lord. Listen to me, folks. There's a Gethsemane. There's a Gabbatha. And there's a Golgotha. That proves that he loves us. Without a doubt, the Lord Jesus loves us. And he loved us enough to go to the cross to die for us. Hallelujah. Calvary is the proof positive of the love of God. There nobody ever loved us like Jesus loved us. Stripped naked, Matthew 27, 35. Crucified, Matthew 27, 35. Abandoned of his own father, Matthew 27, 46. And marred beyond belief. I believe in the vicarious suffering and death of my Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes it gets lonely. Sometimes you doubt. You doubt God's mercy for you. You doubt God's love for you. You do. That's just human nature. Sometimes you wonder what you've done wrong. We haven't, it's not a matter of what you've done. It's a matter of God allowing circumstances to work together. Amen. We can't ever figure that out. I'm not smart enough to do that. I can't create the circumstances that I think will bring harmony or the presence of God in my life. But I believe Him. Amen. And I believe in Him. Amen. And I'm going to trust Him Amen. by the grace of God with everything I've got in me. And I ask you to do that today. And some of you need that bad. You need it real bad. Because you're starting, to, you're starting to drift. You're starting to fall away. You're starting to lose faith. You're starting to lose your anchor. And Satan is, oh, how quick he is to step into the vacuum. And offer you something here and now, right now, right here. To satisfy you. And all he'll do is to tickle and tantalize the flesh. Suck you in and put the hook in you. And boy, when he sucks you in and puts the hook in you, he'll pull you straight down. But Christ came. Wilt thou be made whole? Will you be made whole? Amen. Will you be made whole? That's a simple question. That demands a simple answer. Will you be made whole? Father, in thy name I pray. I believe they have some people in this house this morning that want to be made whole, Lord. Their faith is shaken. Their foundation's weakening. Their rock is no longer a stable foundation for them. And they're unsure of so many things that they were certain of just a few weeks or months or years ago. They're not sure of it this morning. Heavenly Father, when our Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, he became the author and finisher of our faith. He designed our faith. He perfected our faith. And now we who are born again are born again by the grace of God and our great high priest is in your presence daily to see to it that our faith grows and matures. And the power of the Holy Spirit of God will work that out in us. In Jesus' name we pray. We love you because you loved us. In the holy name.